Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stan Hudson, and I am uh, the executive director here at the Theodore Roosevelt Inaugural National Historic Site. I'm very pleased that we're here this evening partnering with the American Association of University Women uh, to uh, do a presentation that I think will be of interest to everyone and certainly very topical uh, given that this is the last day of Black History Month. Without further ado, um, oh, I did want to share one thing with you. Something that we just found out about the site in recent years and uh, we, we think it's important enough that we now include it in all of our tours. That is, on the very evening that Theodore Roosevelt took the oath of office here as our 26th president, he thought it important enough in addressing the issue of race in this country that he uh, dictated a short letter, definitely not more than about three or four sentences, inviting Booker T. Washington to Washington to dine with the President of the United States in the White House. Well, of course, there was an uproar. Southern papers were very cruel to the President. Uh, but uh, about a month after that letter left this house uh, in Buffalo uh, on its way to Tuskegee, um, Booker T. Washington on October the 16th of 1901 did indeed dine with President Roosevelt. So it's something that we discovered. Uh, we have the letter, uh, facsimile thereof, uh, downstairs. And as I said, we, uh, we highlight that Roosevelt had a, a, a very mixed record uh, in, in terms of race, but that was, uh, that was something that we like to highlight as, as one of the pluses of, of his uh, presidency. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, the uh, American Association of, you know, of, of, of University Women. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost the, the tongue tire that uh, the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural National Historic Site is. Um, I'd like to introduce your Vice President, Marion Deutschman. Thank you, Stan. Uh, as Stan mentioned, February, as you probably all know, it is Black History Month, when we pay tribute to the generations of African Americans who struggled with adversity to achieve full citizenship in America. What better book to review than The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson? It's not a new book, but I, when I read it, I found it unforgettable. And I had my son read it, and other people read it. Uh, but unforgettable, but who but Bob Posick? to give us an unforgettable review of the untold story of a few of the people who participated in the Great Migration from the South to the North from 1915 to 1970. If, uh, Betty Preble always does a great job uh, at our newsletter for AAUW, and if you had the newsletter, then you would uh, know the information about Bob Posick. But I know that there are people here who may not have gotten the newsletter. So I'd like to introduce him and give you some of his background because I've introduced him other times, I've heard him speak other times, and I know you're going to like his presentation. Bob Posick received his bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Binghamton and his master's degree in special education from Syracuse University. Having been awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to India, Bob spent three years studying and working in India. This included volunteer work with Tibetan refugees, 
and having several private audiences with the Dalai Lama. He then worked for 26 years for the New York State Education Department and for an additional 10 years for a research and evaluation firm based in New York City. He's now retired. Bob serves locally as a presenter for a wide range of community groups and organizations. He has done presentations on a variety of topics. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, the Amazon rainforest, Steve Jobs, the Dalai Lama, Islam, Notre Dame, Alexander Hamilton, and China. So we might have him again. <laughs> He, was all, he has also become a regular contributor. If, you look, if it sounds or looks familiar, or if the name sounds familiar, he has been a regular contributor to the Buffalo News. He's had 67, more since then, 67 My View columns, and 15 Another Voice columns that appear in the newspaper. They've limited those now, haven't they, unfortunately. Bob has lived and traveled extensively abroad, including, as I've mentioned, India, China, Japan, Tibet, and the Amazon River in Peru. Bob Hasek. It's always kind of embarrassing to sit and be introduced. But I always think, gee, I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> this sounds really, really interesting. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is the first time I've done a program at the TR, I call it the TR Center, because I cannot possibly remember the full title of the, of the thing. It's true, it's complicated. I do programs for a wide range of community groups, a number of which deal with American history. And though we have a relatively short history as a country, I'm always amazed at how little we know about our own history. Dad, the African American experience is an integral part of American history. Um, so let's learn some history tonight. We'll be working from the wonderful book, The Warmth of Other Suns. Um, it was first published in 2011, just about 12 years ago was written by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, she was the first black woman in the history of American journalism to win the Pulitzer Prize. Make no mistake, this book is based on meticulous research, including more than a thousand individual interviews um, of people who participated in the Great Migration. From among those that she interviewed, she selected three people to dig into more deeply, to understand it through their personal experience as a woman and two men. Isabel Wilkerson is a journalist, not a historian, and she pays attention to history, but I think it's what makes this book good is as a journalist, she understands we learn more from stories than we do from dry facts and footnotes. That's what brings history alive, and she chronicles one of the great untold stories in American history, the Great Migration from 1915 to 1970, more than six million black citizens left not only for the North, but for the Midwest and the Far West. All of them were in search of a better life. They traveled in small numbers. They traveled in large numbers. The exodus of six million people was vast, Interestingly enough, it was leaderless. It was not organized by anyone or any group. It, it occurred spontaneously all across the South. It was a turning point in our nation's history. It would transform every urban center that they arrived at uh, uh, in every city that they touched. Places they went to, for them, remember these were mostly rural farm people, were big and intimidating. Here they were encountering New York City, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles. 
it would not end until the 1970s when the South began to change. That's when people decided that, that they might stay where they were. They were simply doing what people throughout time have done when they're looking for freedom. They left. They moved. Um, now, you know, there's been a bit of furor recently about critical race theory. I won't even get into it because it's so foolish. But if we just stick with the facts, you know, there's, it doesn't have to be a theory about race in this country. It happened. It's a fact. You can see it. It's everywhere. There's a well-documented history of African Americans right from early enslavement right up to the present time. It is a history fraught with pain and sorrow, but not without contributions, progress, and hope. Before we get into the book, let's begin earlier in time. Uh, as far as can be determined, the first Africans were brought as slaves to this region um, in 1526. This means that by the time our country was established in 1776, slavery had been present here for 250 years, a quarter of a millennium. By the time slaves in the South were declared free by the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery had existed on our shores for 330 years. Given that long history, is it any wonder that race and racism are so deeply embedded, entrenched in our society and culture? Let's take a look first at the African slave trade. This is how they, they came to this, this uh, country. First, the first slave traders were Portuguese, later Dutch and English. A uh, great majority of Africans were taken to the Caribbean, which they called the West Indies at that time, and Brazil, as can be seen in this map of the African slave trade. So let me just explicate the map a little bit. Um, on the right side of the map is the continent of Africa, then the Atlantic Ocean, and then what was called the New World sometimes, North America and South America. Let's go back to Africa a bit. The blue lines are slave trade lines. You'll see some in the north going up. There was a slave trade for a long period of time to Muslim countries in North Africa and in the Middle East. Black slaves were taken as far as India. But the major slave trade occurred in the west coast of Africa. The biggest blue lines, as you can see, are the ones heading over. The largest number of slaves were taken to the West Indies, worked on the sugar plantations, Cuba, Haiti, and other islands in that area. The next largest number, toward the bottom of the map, went to Brazil, worked on uh, sugar plantations, later rubber plantations. Relatively small number um, went up to North America, from the, from the uh, West Indies and settled in the colonies. Just so you have some sense of where they're placed. Now, um, the, uh, now, let me go back to where I wanted to be. This is an illustration of an African slave ship. The conditions were crowded and brutal. I mean, it was, and also, what you have to remember, I only learned this uh, when I did background research for this, it isn't that a slave ship went from a particular place in Africa to a particular place where they were dropping off. Sometimes slaves were on a ship for up to a year. What they would do is they would capture slaves in a certain part of Africa, move to another part, capture more slaves, some of them would die, then they needed more, and they would go port to port to port until they had a full load, and then they would set across. Can you imagine the, 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 the it was a brutal situation. Um, it's estimated that 12 million Africans were brought across the Atlantic as slaves. Many died en route. An estimated 10 million of them actually survived the crossing. An estimated 25% of them were children, which we don't often think of in the slave trade. Why children? Why do you have the most time to make use of them if you have all, their, all the years that they were growing up? Um, of those brought over from Africa, uh, more than 90% went to the Caribbean and Brazil. Um, a small percentage, an estimated 400,000, were brought to the British colonies as slaves. They worked to grow tobacco and rice were the first plantation crops, later cotton. By 1860, 
just prior to the start of the Civil War in 1861, the number of slaves in America, according to the U.S. Census, had grown to nearly four million. Why such a tenfold increase from 400,000 to four million over that period? It wasn't because so many more slaves were brought in. In fact, by around 1808, slave, uh, the slave trade had been abolished. Um, the reason can be, can be seen by looking at the record of births. Um, average female slave gave birth to nine to ten children. They were essentially bred as livestock. They were considered valuable commodities. They could be bought, they could be sold, they could be traded to settle debts. They were an essential part of the labor force of this, and the economy of the South. Now, this four million slaves was very unevenly distributed in the country. Um, according to the 1860 uh, census, 34 states reported having no, uh, there were 34 states in the Union at that time. 20 of them reported having no resident slaves. 14 states reported having slaves. I want to show you the southern states with the highest number of slaves as a percent of their population. First was South Carolina. 57% of the population of South Carolina were black, black African slaves. Mississippi, 55%, Louisiana, 47% on down. So you have to realize, that means that six out of every 10 people in South Carolina were slaves. I mean, that's sort of, I mean it's, it's no wonder that they kept such tight control over the slaves, not allowing them to read, restricting their knowledge of where they were, just confining them because they were continually afraid of slave rebellion and slave escape, so they kept an iron tight control on the slaves. I think it's no accident that South Carolina is where the Civil War started. That it was, it was uh, slavery was so deeply embedded in its culture. Um, now, uh, the, just in 1910, which is when the, that census was taken, just prior to the Great Migration, there were 9.8 million black citizens. By 1970, this had grown to 26.6 million black citizens, and by 2020, to 41.1 million black citizens. Um, to bring us up to date, uh, the current, and I'm going to go back toward the end of the 2020 census, it reached 40, 41 million. Um, professor, historian, and filmmaker Lewis, Henry Lewis Gates Jr. Um, helped develop a marvelous series. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it, called The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. Gates note how remarkable it is that the 40 million African Americans living in America today are largely the descendants of the 400,000 who came over originally as slaves and, and grew over time. Now I want to get to Isabel Wilkerson's book. Um, I told you that she selected three individuals, a woman and two men, to structure the book around, to tell the story in more human terms. So let's meet them. First, Ida Mae Brandon Gladney. Um, is it, uh, first she deals with her getting her family ready to leave rural Mississippi for the North in 1937. I quote from the book. Ida Mae tried to get the children ready and gathered their clothes and quilts. She had sold off the turkeys and doled out in secret the old stools, the wash pots, the tin tub, the bed pallets. Her husband was settling with his boss for the worth of a year's labor. None of them had been on a train before. None of them had been out of Mississippi or Chickasaw County for that matter. They and all they could carry were loaded onto a brother-in-law's truck to meet Ida May's husband at the train depot for the night ride out of the bottomland. This is how one of the men, George Swanson Starling, uh, described his departure from Florida for the North in 1945. I quote again. A man gave George Starling a ride to the train station a railing divided the stairs onto the train, one side of the railing for white passengers, the other for colored, so that the soles of their shoes would not touch the same stair. I mean, can you imagine this? 
They walked the same roads to get to the train station, mm -hmm. but the, con the contamination that they were felt to have extended to the bottom of their soul, so you did not want to. It's something that's hard for us to imagine. I continue. He hadn't had time to bid farewell to everyone he wanted to. He was on the run and wouldn't rest easy until he was out of Lake County. He was packed into the Jim Crow car where the railroad stored the luggage. He didn't know what he would do once he got to New York or what his life would be. As he settled in for the 23-hour train ride up the coast of the Atlantic, he turned his face to the north and sat with his back to Florida. The second man, Robert Pershing, uh, Robert Joseph Pershing Foster, who left Louisiana for the West in 1953. I want to point out in the structure of the book, it's very interesting. She has three people that we follow throughout the book. One left in the 1930s, one in the 1940s, one in the 1950s. One left from the East Coast, one from the Central, and one from the Western part of the South. So that she's trying to give a more complete <coughs> picture of the, of the movement. This is how she describes Robert Pershing Foster leaving. In the dark hours of the morning, Pershing Foster packed his surgery books, his medical bag, and his suit and sports coats in the trunk, along with a map and a dress book and Ivory Covington's fried chicken left over from Saturday night. He had said goodbye to his father, who had told him to follow his dreams. Perhaps he might have stayed had they let him practice surgery as he was trained to do, or try on a suit like anyone else of his station. Like many men in the, Black, in the Great Migration, he was setting out on his own. He pointed his 1949 Buick Roadmaster west, alone in the car he had close to 2,000 miles ahead of him to reach California. There's so many sad details in this book. He thought, Robert Kurt, he's a trained physician. He's not a poor farm, he's a trained physician. Drove his car, he thought, well, when I get to Arizona, I'll find a motel that I can stay in. No, no, he, he had to travel all the way through to California. So the, uh, the, the tentacles of racism stretch far. You know the story of the Green Book and how the, uh, the, the, the people use that to uh, know where to, to stay. Um, now we're going to learn more about Ina Mae George and Robert a little later on. So things had to be pretty bad before people left their homes for a new life in a strange land where they would certainly feel out of place. It meant leaving behind family members, friends, neighbors, familiar seasons, the slant of the sun, the soil, the trees, the plants, traditional foods, churches and graves. African American poet Richard Wright captured it. I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking part of the South to transplant in alien soil to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. So you can be sure that it was pretty awful living in the Jim Crow South. I mean, we know under Jim Crow there were white elevators and colored elevators. There were white train platforms and colored train platforms, and on and on, including separate ambulances, separate hearses, separate telephone booths, bank tellers, taxi cabs. The division, the separation was absolutely complete in Southern culture. There are two examples of, of it, and uh, uh, this and this. I will say about this, I, one of the programs I do is on Colin Powell, who is, I think, one of our great Americans, a very phenomenal <coughs> man, and in, it's, a, it's his autobiography, and he describes how he lived in the Bronx, he lived in a multiracial community, and joined the army, and was sent to south to a training facility somewhere in the southern states. The people said to him, Colin, 
there's certain things you need to learn before you go. And one, if you see a white woman walking down the sidewalk on the side that you are on, you cross to the other side of the street and don't look any white person directly in the eyes. You can shop in Woolworths, but you can't eat at the lunch counter, as this represents. Why? Because you'd be using the same dishes, the same, your lips would touch the same glasses, you'd be sitting on the same, same benches. It's uh, hard to tell this, but it's true. Um, now, so everything was separated, but it, it was deeper than that. I mean, for all of its upheaval, the South had left most blacks no better off economically than they had been before. Sharecropping, um, slavery's replacement kept them in debt and still bound to whatever plantation they worked. By 1905, every southern state from Florida to Texas outlawed blacks from sitting next to whites on public conveyances. Across the South, someone was hanged or burned alive every four days from 1889 to 1929. Most photos of lynchings and burnings are too gruesome to bring to you. I mean, they're just, this is a one I thought was except because it was almost symbolic of a lynching. But make no mistake, these were public celebratory events. These were not solemn, jud carrying out judicial sort of orders. This was, uh, people brought picnic lunches, families came. They, there was actually a thriving trade of uh, photographers would come and take photographs of people who were lynched and burned and sell them to people. And then they would send them postcards across the country saying, guess what? You know, I, I, was, finally the post office said, no, we will not deliver any more of these postcards. People put them inside envelopes and sent them. It's a, it's a, these are hard things. We need to know these things as Americans, don't you think? I mean, this is part of our history. Um, this was the era of the Ku Klux Klan, openly <coughs> operating in the southern cities and towns. As I found out just recently, there were Ku Klux Klan chapters in western New York. They were in, in Akron and in other places out, and they were mostly anti-immigrant groups, as more than anti-black groups, but they were the same kind of thing. Um, Isabel Wilkerson sums it up this way, I quote, an invisible hand ruled the lives of all colored people. The hand had determined that white people were in charge and colored people were under them and had to obey them like a child in those days had to obey a parent, except there was no love between the two parties as there is between a parent and a child. Instead, there was mostly fear and dependence and hatred of that dependence on both sides. This was a mutual dependence and was not healthy or good for, for either party. So how did they migrate from the South to their destinations and, and new lives? A British historian describes the flow of large migrations. Migratory currents flow along certain well-defined channels like a mighty river. So let's look at a map of the Great Migration. Uh, there, are three, there were three primary tributaries in the, in, the, in the Great Migration. First was on the East Coast, which people from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, traveled up largely by train to northern cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston. That's the route that George Swanson Starling took. In the center of the country, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky, the route essentially followed the Mississippi River, largely by train, and went up to northern cities including Columbus, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Indianapolis, Chicago, Toledo, Milwaukee, Detroit. The third tributary started in the areas of Arkansas, uh, Louisiana, and Texas, and largely went out to the west coast, either up north to Oakland and San Francisco or south to Los Angeles. This was mostly by car or bus. Um, Los Angeles is where um, Robert Pershing uh, settled. The journey was not 
an easy one. Those traveling by train encountered discrimination in facilities. On the train, white passengers rode in comfortable railway cars, while black passengers rode in crowded cars along with the baggage. Now there was both loss and ambivalent feelings about leaving their homes in the south. It was not an easy process to do. Captured by poet Langston Hughes. The lazy laughing south with blood in its mouth, passionate, cruel, honey-lipped, syphilitic, that is the south. And I who am black would love her, but she spits in my face. So now I seek the north, the cold-faced north, for she, they say, is a kinder mistress. So was the north and the midwest and the far west a kinder mistress? I wish I could tell you that they were welcomed as brothers and sisters from the south, fellow Americans, citizens, human beings seeking freedom and opportunity, but most often they encountered fear, resentment, open hostility, sometimes violence. They had to adjust to living in strange cities. Remember, most of them came from rural South. There was a strong family structure in the South, largely organized around the churches, um, that they brought with them, but was soon upended by living in poverty in crowded tenements. There was mostly low-wage employment available, and even that was not easy to come by. This often required both parents to work to make ends meet, leaving their children unsupervised and subject to temptations and bad influences. This was the beginning of the poverty, broken families, and crime present in our inner cities today. We know this from the poor, neglected sections of the city of Buffalo. So what can we say about the migrants from the South? Those who made it out were a resilient group of survivors. They had a history of hard work and work ethic, a strong and stable family structure, were often churchgoers, and had a willingness to do whatever it would take to survive. Did they bring crime and poverty to urban areas? More likely, they were brought down by the poverty and the poor living conditions they had to endure. Now, I must tell you some more about the three uh, people around whom Isabel Wilkerson structures much of the book. She includes no photographs of them in the book. But I was curious, you know, what do they look like? You may be curious too. You may be going to want to know that. So um, there are not a lot of photographs of them. But here's a photograph of Ida Mae Brandon Gladney. Uh, married at 16, she and her husband George lived on land that nobody wanted. They picked cotton on a plantation from sunrise until they could no longer see. They could barely stand <coughs> upright from the stooping. Ida Mae's husband George, after a friend of his was beaten with chains unjustly, they suspected he had stolen some chickens, which he hadn't, George said to her, this is the last crop we make him. He's fed up. In Chicago, um, she and her family moved off and seeking to improve their living conditions. Now, they didn't have a lot of options. When blacks moved into, into cities in the, in the north and the west, um, there were only certain areas they could live in. Now, what's that? I mean, this is, oh, well, let's, let's go over here. Like, at the risk of their lives, they would do that. I mean, and, and, and and when blacks intruded into white neighborhoods, there was active violence and riots. So they, they were essentially confined into certain parts of the city. Poor housing, um, small housing, crowded housing, and as more blacks came up from the south, the, it got more crowded and crowded. You had multiple people and families living in the same environment. It was just something, and, and there was no way that they could burst out of that. Um, so the, the item made, it's moved around different places in Chicago trying to find a place that was more decent to live. Um, she had three children, number of grandchildren. At age 57, 
Ida May and her family were featured in a Chicago uh, newspaper in an ad by a local supermarket representing a typical family at Thanksgiving. So this is progress in that. This is now a typical family in the city of Chicago. Um, Ida May was the matriarch of her family. Her life revolved around family, church, and work as it had in Mississippi. Isabel Wilkerson concluded from all of her interviews that Ida May was the happiest of the three people she featured in the book, lived the longest, and she was featured in the book because she lived in the moment and remained her true, original self. Now George Swanson started. Uh, over six feet tall, George worked in the Florida fruit groves picking oranges, tangerines, and grapefruit. He learned that the trees were pampered like infants. Fruit had to be unblemished and ungroomed. In other words, the workers were treated terribly, but the fruit was, was treated well. Um, this is some of the fruit workers in perilous ladders to do the picking. Um, but George had this idea. He said, well, this fruit is valuable to the owners. So if we went on strike and didn't pick it, they would lose the whole crop. So we could demand better wages to do that. And it succeeded. He did. He had the owners a bit over a barrel. Um, they needed to get the fruit picked and sent to market. Then one day he got word that the owners were going to take him to a swamp and hang him. He needed to leave. That's why he was on the run. And did so with little more than a change of clothes. In New York City, he got a job working as a coach attendant on the rail lines running up and down the East Coast, the very train he rode when he migrated north. He tried to help migrants like himself in the Jim Crow cars. He knew the fear and uncertainty in their hearts because he had felt it himself. He lived in the basement of a brownstone in Harlem. The one constant in his life was his job on the railroad. He was a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, though Isabel Wilkerson, when she interviewed him, sensed an aloneness in his life. After 51 years away from Florida, he finally made a trip home. He and his old friend Reuben visited the places where he had picked fruit. Uh, George is in the uh, straw hat in front of one of the places where fruit was stored. They also sat on the railway platform where he departed 51 years before. At his funeral service, a cousin said of him, little Georgie never forgot where he came from. Remember, he helped others. That was his instinct, to help others along the way he himself. Last, Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. He was the son of the principal of the Monroe Colored High School and his mother who taught seventh grade there. He had high aspirations and always dreamed of the good life. He graduated from Morehouse, the most prestigious college in the country for colored men, and became a board certified surgeon. A physician for most of his adult life, and by all accounts a very good one, he found that his career in medicine was continually limited because he was black. He always worked below his level of training and had to take whatever work was available to him. In California, he finally found a measure of success and proceeded to live the good life he had always dreamed of. Yet toward the end of his career, he came to be resented and humiliated by the hospital staff where he practiced. A friend commented, he was dying on the inside. He did well on the outside, but he died on the inside. He lived out his life in a 3,600 square foot Spanish style mansion. In 1978, he planned a big party to celebrate his life's successes. He wore a black crushed velvet suit. People did that at that time. A black, black crushed velvet suit in both time, and had a photo album made of the evening. This was proof that he had arrived. Um, now I want to uh, step a bit beyond the book and I think I will pull out one of the key issues of the book to explore uh, a little bit further. And this deals with housing discrimination and its impact 
on the black population and household wealth of black versus white Americans over time and at the present. It began innocently enough, as most things do. Most, most federal legislation, most bills, always start out with a good intent and then can get subverted or changed in a way. And that's what happened. Um, this was the Depression. You have to think, now we're in the Depression, the 1920s. Um, uh, people's homes were being foreclosed. People were losing their homes. Um, the federal government, Congress decided, we have to do something about that. So they passed legislation um, creating the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933. The corporation purchased and refinanced mortgages at cheaper rates so people could afford them. By the time it's lended, ending in 1936, it's so operated for a three-year period, um, uh, they made more than a million loans, making it the owner of one-sixth of urban home ownership debt. So far, so good. But it did something else that has come to be known as redlining. It developed a neighborhood mortgage rating system to identify for banks areas deemed in, to be in high risk of default. The lowest ranked neighborhoods, not surprisingly, had high concentrations of racial minorities. Maps were developed for cities. This is one of the earliest maps of the city of Philadelphia in the 1930s. Um, when they talk redlining, they mean red. There's certain sets, the, the, the corporation outlined certain areas in red that were called hazardous. Give a mortgage in this area at your risk. It's probably going to be defaulted on. And then they ranked all other areas up into the ones that were the best. Well, if you lived in the best area, you'd get a nice low-cost mortgage and, and easily to do it. Um, if, if, but blacks could not move to those areas, so they were constrained. In the, in the areas where they were forced to live, um, the uh, banks would not give loans. These maps were developed for cities all across the country. Here's the redlining map of Milwaukee. This was not hidden, this is not secret. Uh, map of San Francisco. Map of Brooklyn. Um, it, uh, uh, it basically made it very difficult for blacks to get mortgages. Therefore, difficult to own a home. Therefore, forcing them to continue to be renters and, and not have property. Um, uh, now, I don't know where you live, suburban or urban or whatever, but for many people, our home is our primary asset. That's where family wealth is usually held, is in a home. Home can be sold. You can, you can leave your home to the next generation. Things pass on. It's, a, it's such an important thing. If you're a renter, you have nothing. The month you stop paying the rent, that's it. You have nothing left. You can't pass along the rent. I mean, it's a, it's a bad state to be in. Um, it, uh, that disadvantage, though it was created in the 1930s, continued right up to the end of World War II when servicemen returned home from the war. Um, what came to be popularly known as the GI Bill was signed into law by Franklin Roosevelt in 19. Oh, if I'm, in the, I'm sorry, I didn't show you this. This show, these were all the cities in the country where maps were developed. This is not just done in a few places, this was done all across the country. It was a national uh, impact. Now I want to take you to uh, Franklin Roosevelt signing the GI Bill. As impossible as it might be to believe today, the GI Bill was passed unanimously by both the House and the Senate. Can you imagine us doing anything like that today? Um, right, by both parties, by everyone. Or, or, um, everyone had a sense, servicemen, sometimes servicewomen, had fought for their country. They were out of uh, education, out of employment for a number of years. They needed to be helped to resettle back in the United States. Good, I mean, it's a good purpose. There were two things that the GI Bill made available. Uh, loans to go back to school and finish your education, and loans for buying homes or starting up businesses. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the home side 
but the education side is a sad story in its own right. This was funds that would help GIs go to, go to college after they got back from the war. In order to get that bill through Congress on a unanimous basis, an agreement was, was forced by a very prominent Southern Senator who was head of one of the prime committees that said, education will be done on a state basis, not a federal basis. And so what happened was now a state bill. All of the southern states enacted rules that said um, you can only go to a black college or university. That's the only place you can use your education. Now they're good black colleges and universities in the south, but maybe not where you're living, maybe not in the field that you want to study. It's kind of so that that sort of put a lot of restrictions on the education side. Um, on the, on the, the mortgage side. Um, they were intended to be low, low loan mortgages. Um, good idea. Devil was in the details. It worked very well for returning white servicemen and not very well at all for returning black servicemen. Here are two images from promotional materials of the time. It doesn't take a lot to see. These are very white. These are very white sort of images. Um, and it kind of reflected how things work out. This program worked well for white people. They knew this would happen, and special effort was expended among black servicemen to learn how to take advantage of the GI Bill. They ran training programs and coached each other on how to do it. The problem was, in the mortgage end of things, they ran into redlining. So, you know, it, it, um, it, it wasn't as though they could uh, go into a suburban area and pick out a house and say, I want a mortgage for that. There were so many barriers. Some people said, we cannot show our house to black people. There were so many sort of things. Or the realtors would just not tell people about houses. So they ended up looking for housing in the inner cities. When they did that, they then hit redlining. Well, we had no mortgages to give, sort of in this thing. It's um, it's uh, uh, now this was still in the Jim Crow era, but it worked in the North as well as the South for white veterans and their families. They flowed into the newly created suburbs just fine, and black servicemen and their families were left behind in the inner cities. Um, this led to disparities in household wealth. Um, it's kind of, uh, some of it is shocking. If you look at home, this is home ownership. 70%, 76% of white families own their own home. 61% of African, of, of Asian Americans, 51% of Hispanics, 47% of African Americans. You know what? It's half African American families own their own homes. That's all good. Well, it's a 29% gap between white and black populations in terms of their access to this. Um, and this has a huge impact on household wealth. When they, do, when they survey household wealth for families, when the, when the federal government does this, homeowners had, and this is from uh, 2016, had a median household wealth of $254,000. That was their wealth as a household, as a family. 98,000 excluding home equity. Home equity was the biggest part of that wealth. If you're a renter, Renters had median household wealth of $6,270. That was the, this is the great dividing line. Home ownership and renting is, uh, is a huge discriminator. Um, to me, this provides a good example of what is called systemic racism, institutional racism, which people have a hard time with dealing with. But, but I want to make a distinction in this between Racism embedded in systems and individual prejudice. These are two very different things. So imagine, you're a branch bank manager back in the 1940s, and you have a nice black family come into, husband and wife come into the bank. They want to buy a home. You know, they're kind of back. They want to sort of do this. And you might even like them. You might even feel sympathy for them. But the rules of the bank say you can't give a mortgage in the area that they want to buy the house. Or you give a mortgage with such a ridiculously high interest rate that they can't afford it. 
where no mortgages are available at this time. Come back in three months, we might have something available. And it doesn't matter that this is not the action of the individual person which would be prejudicial. It's just the system. It's just how systems get embedded and they operate. Now, I have to admit, I have a deep connection to this subject. Our son, Philip, is married to an African-American woman, Brandy. They have two fine sons, Pace and Paxton. Here's a, here's a photo of them. Fine family. They live in the Albany area. Both Philip and Brandy have their master's degrees and work in the field of education. Tickled gladdens my heart because that was my field. Brandy works for an online college as an adjunct faculty member and academic evaluator. Philip works at Union College in Schenectady as director of its academic opportunity program, which helps disadvantaged students to enroll in succeeding college. He and his staff are very, very good at their work. They really, they, I mean, they know how to do it. Almost every, see, he talks to me a lot about this. Right? Almost every student in the academic opportunity program is the first person in their family to ever go to college. So they have no history or tradition. Both of my parents graduated from college. They're just walking, they're going to go to college. That's it. Like, there's no history in the family. So here they are, kind of on a college campus, breaking in to this society, maybe not being as well prepared as some of the other students with the coursework they're taking, but Philip and his staff work with them, coach them, support them, serve as intermediaries with the faculty to make it work. They've, he's been doing this for 14 years now. They have a higher graduation rate for the academic opportunity students than they do for the regular students who are paying full freight. I mean, this, these students work hard. They, they do one. In fact, there was maybe a month ago, there was a piece on uh, Spectrum News, I think, that said um, a uh, New York State student was just awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford uh, and uh, from Union College in Schenectady. So I called the woman and I said, did you know that a student from Union College just won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford? He said, yeah, it was a student in our program. You know, there's talent there. There's talent there, there's intelligence there, and we lose it. Not only do they lose it, but we lose it when they don't. So, and needless, if you look at this photo, needless to say, but I would say it anyway, Pace and Paxton are the apples of their grandparents' eyes. <laughs> They're biracial boys. I, they live in a great neighborhood, go to great schools. I hope they will grow up to navigate comfortably and safely in both black and white worlds. I also hope that in the future such blended families may help everyone to our society to be more tolerant and accepting of differences and not so fearful. Um, but I understand, and they understand, that when Pace and Paxton grow up, they will be viewed as black men. Whatever baggage comes from being a black man, whatever threat comes from it, they will have that. Doesn't matter color, there's a man. And I just hope and pray that they make it safely through life and don't end up someday being in the wrong place at the wrong time and not making it up. That is reality. But we can change that reality. Um, this is a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do it. I hope it, it, the program today gave you a better sense of this as an essential part of our nation's history. Um, I have just a teensy bit more to add. There's a little postscript. And then, am I doing okay on time? Everybody? Oh, yeah. They haven't gotten okay. Um, I want to bring us up to date with African Americans uh, today. 2020 census, 41 million uh, African Americans, represents about 12% of our population. That figure, 12 to 13%, has remained steady for decades. The Hispanic portion of our population goes up seven percent to ten percent to eighteen percent to twenty percent to twenty-four percent is is growing all the time. And, and the Asian American population slower. But African American population has been a stable one. Um, that's might be interesting to know where do they live? I mean where 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 does this population in our country settle? 
Um, these are the top 10 states uh, by African American population. Top three, Texas, Georgia, Florida. Might not be a surprise to you. I highlighted New York, California, and Illinois because that's where the three people in the book sort of came from. Maryland, Virginia, Ohio. So it's um, so they're spread out, but still a lot of southern states. Um, it's another way of looking at it that makes that even clearer. Um, uh, highest proportion. These are the this is the percent of people in each state that are African American. Mississippi, 37 percent. Four out of every ten um, uh, people who live in Mississippi are African American, and you see down the down the line. Not as high as it was during the Civil War. For sure. This is a map that might illustrate this. Blue means African American. That's the easiest way to look at this map. Um, and you see the intensity of blue indicates where the largest numbers of people live. You'll see that the states with the highest proportion of African Americans are some of the basic ones, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Um, though many blacks moved out of the South, many more stayed in the South. It's hard to leave home. It's hard. We know this with immigrants and refugees. It's it's the it's not the usual person who leaves their country for another country. That takes certain courage and and, and, and sort of get going. It's why I think that immigrants and refugees are so valuable in a society because they are the most entrepreneurial, <coughs> adventurous, resilient people because they were the ones that had the courage and the wherewithal to get up and change. Um, I thought you might be interested in cities. These are the cities with the highest proportion of uh, African Americans in their population. Detroit, the highest, 79%. Memphis, Baltimore. That means eight out of every ten people living in the city of Detroit are black. It's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Then I thought I wanted to add in the uh, cities where our folks in the book came from. Chicago, 30%. New York City, 24%. Los Angeles, 9%. That's a very interesting figure, that 9%. There's a, there's a really easy explanation for it. In Los Angeles, 48% of the population of the city are Hispanic or Latino, 12% are Asian, and 9% and, uh, are black. Now, if someone is a quick calculator, you could tell me how much that all added up to. What percentage of the, city, of the residents of Los Angeles are what we would call minorities? 59? 69. 69. You'd have to say this is a multiracial city. And, uh, and when, they, when they run, that's, that's the information I have to share, but I'll just say one more thing. When they run population trend lines out into 2030, 2040, 2050, increasingly, um, states are going to have a higher minority population combined than white population. It's just, it's, uh, and, and that will happen in cities. So, so I think there are already three states for which that has happened. Hawaii, California, and Arizona, I think. Um, some people are very threatened by that. Like, oh, what's going to happen? We can we are not the majority. Well, so, you know, it's kind of scary like that. To me, it's like, welcome to the world that we live in. And what's wrong with there being different people? Once, you know, as long as everybody has a fair share and an opportunity to improve themselves, diversity has always released energy and innovation, entrepreneurship and invention. Almost all kind of uh, inventions and creations and developments came out of urban areas all the way back in time. You know, it could be Baghdad, it could, it could be Cairo, it could be Delhi. But that, those were the places where people blended from all over the place. And when that happens, you get the friction that produces new ideas and new innovations. So anyway, I, I went a bit beyond the book. I, I actually added the whole section about slavery before. That's not in the book. But she only deals with 1915 to 1970, so all the slavery part is before, and all the part that I dealt with about today is afterward. But I hope they amplified and added things to the books, maybe for people who read them. So 
Thank you very much for this.